Welcome to the 88th Annual Postgraduate Convention of Loma Linda University. So Dr. Warren Peters of the Center of Health Promotion asked me to talk to you today specifically about the psychiatric needs of our youth, um, which is the title of this talk. And why this topic? Why did he choose this title uh, for the talk? Well, um, because as you know, and as you will see in the next talk with Dr. David Pewter, um, up to half of our about up to half, uh, many of our youth, up to half of them are actually in crisis. Uh, Dr. David Pewter will talk to you next about the unprecedented rates of suicide and addiction in our youth. Um, and why me? I think that's because, um, let's see, is this a touch screen? Can I um, actually ask the AV person to help me with these? Because some of them are quite long. Um, is there a way that I can actually scroll down here? Ah, good. Okay, thank you. Super important. Okay, so um, so why do you ask me? I think it's because I'm one of the handful of child and adolescent psychiatrists here at Loma Linda. There are only about six of us right now. Um, and also, you know, all of us work at all levels of psychiatry in Loma Linda, from the inpatient unit to the partial hospitalization program to the inpatient uh, to the um, intensive outpatient programs to the uh, sort of outpatient programs. So we all work in several of these settings and I've been here for a few years now. So I have another, other special qualifications except that I raised my three kids in Palo Alto. And Palo Alto was the initial hub of the autism epidemic. It was also the initial hub of the suicide clusters that started out um, around the year 2008 so 2008 through 2001, Palo Alto had its first teen suicide cluster. Six high school students um, committed suicide, many of them by uh, throwing themselves onto the Caltrain tracks, or um, one of them was observed from a great distance on hands and knees, going back and forth to the train, back to her car, to the train, back to her car, until finally tumbling in to her death. So all of my kids knew at least one person who died. And for my daughter, it was a pretty close friend, uh, one who shared a private art tutor with her. So we all felt the impact as community members up in Palo Alto, even back then over 10 years ago. So since then, Palo Alto saw another suicide cluster in 14 and 15, and now in 2020. Uh, the clusters like that first one in Palo Alto are just about everywhere. For example, in Rancho Cucamonga two years ago when there were again six. And suicide is now the second leading cause of death um, after accidents for 15 to 34 years old uh, people in the United States. So anyway, so what are the psychiatric needs of our youth? This is a critical question. Bear with me, I'm going to paint a pretty bleak picture with lots of statistics and probably because this is, I am a psychiatrist so I see this sicker half of our, of our kids. So I'm going to barrage you with a lot of statistics for about 15 minutes but then don't worry there's no, there's no test afterward and I'll get through them as fast as I can so that you don't uh, despair or doze off or both. Um, but I wanted to convey to you the landscape uh, of psychiatric illness according to CDC, NIH and DSM-5 then um, I'll actually describe what I see as a child psychiatrist. Okay, so our objectives for today are one, to describe these problems, uh, to characterize the systems that most closely impact our youth, namely the family, schools, and electronic me media, then three, to point to emerging solutions that may allow us collectively to meet these needs of our youth. So first as to numbers, um, I'm just kind of describing youth today. We have right at right now, or more or less, I think these are data from 2017, in the US about 42 million teens. So 30 years from now in 2050, we'll have about 44 million. So of that 42 million, 53% uh, or so are white, about a quarter, 24% are Hispanic, about 14% are black, 5% or so are Asian, about 4% are mixed ethnicity, and by that is meant generally Native American, Hawaiian, or some other. By 2050, these are expected to change, 40% white, 30% Hispanic, 15% black, 10% Asian, 5% 
mixed ethnicity. So where do they live? Uh, as of 2018, 20 uh, million, or about 56% live in the suburbs, so mostly suburban. 11 million, or 31%, live in the cities, so about a third in cities, like inner cities. 5 million, or 17%, live in rural areas. So how are they doing economically? As of 2018, about half are doing okay. They're really doing okay. This is the blue region down here. Uh, with middle to high income, then, you know, about 36% are low income or, you know, kind of struggling. 16% are living in poverty. So of that 42 million teens, over 15 million of them are living with low income. And about 7 million are living in pro poverty. So the federal poverty line, I guess most of you know this, are, is $24,600 for a family of four. This is about 6000 a year for a person, which translates to about 512 a month per person. So nearly 7 million of our teens are living that way without much and in poverty. So now what are some of the common health problems? So these are kind of the biggies. These are the big ones. There are quite a number of them that I'm not including here that are less common, but here are the big ones. Um, lack of sleep, stress, chronic medical illness, anxiety, trauma, alcohol use, cannabis use, and you'll see why I'm listing that as a problem, ADHD, depression, behavioral problems, internet gaming disorder, a new thing, developmental disorders, autism spectrum disorder, nicotine use, eating disorders, gender dysphoric uh, disorder, believe it or not, makes the list of the most common, and psychosis. So first, a non-diagnosis, lack of sleep. I just want to say this first because it contributes to all of them. Um, during the high school years, only about 25% of teens get eight hours of sleep. And you know, generally, teens need nine or 10 hours for optimal growth and intellectual functioning, not eight. But in other words, some 75% of teens are seriously sleep deficient. They're not even getting eight. So among uh, ninth graders, it's 35% who get enough sleep, so that means 65% are sleep deficient. Among 10th graders, it's about 73% sleep deficient. And 11th graders, it's 79% sleep deficient. By the time you're a senior in high school, it's only 18% who are getting enough sleep. I mean, that, and that's 82% sleep deficient. So that's not to say that these 65% to 82% of teens necessarily have insomnia even. Much of that sleeplessness is accounted for by homework, other school stress, or in any case, activities other than sleep. Um, and this one problem contributes to all the others. So next, another non-diagnosis, and it's stress. So according to the APA, the American Psychological Association, 59%, so close to 60% of teens say that, you know, all of these things are problems. So 60% say they can't, you know, trying to juggle all their activities causes stress. 40%, nearly half, say they neglect stuff at home because of stressed out. 40% uh, say, yeah, they're irritable because of stress. And then 30 to 37% say they're at stress levels that make them feel overwhelmed, that they're tired, they're sad or depressed because of their stress levels. So, you know, uh, researchers have linked things like the, the, uh, the, high school, the high school shootings, which now occur about twice monthly or so on average in the U.S., not to mental illness per se, not to pre-existing mental illness, but actually to acute stress, uh, stressful situations. Um, so, you know, and stress, by the way, is different from anxiety. When the stress goes away, good mo mood normally returns, but anxiety is more of a free-floating thing. It doesn't necessarily go away with the disappearance of any one stressor. So the kids are stressed out. Chronic medical illness. Uh, this is a type of diagnosis, but not necessarily a psychiatric one. Chronic medical illness. And these are statistics from 2016-17. Nearly half of adolescents aged 12 to 17, that's 45%, had at least one chronic health condition. So a quarter of teens, 25% of teens, so one in four teens has two or more chronic health conditions. So asthma is the most chronic 
uh, health, the most common chronic health condition affecting more than one in five of our students. It's 23% in uh, about one in five, 23% in 2017. Other common problems, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, back pain, joint pain, infectious diseases, iron deficiency, anemia, that's very common, and migraines. All of those very, very common in our kids nowadays. So um, our first actual psychiatric diagnosis is anxiety, usually either generalized or social anxiety disorder, with or without panic attacks. So um, NIH characterized anxiety levels of teens in 2001 to 4. They found that 32% or so are teens, nearly a third, have some type of anxiety disorder, so a diagnosable disorder. Um, and with this, about 8.3% of those um, had severe impairment from it. So this is really unprecedented uh, in our history. So much anxiety among our high school students. 38% of female teens have a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder, and 26% of male teens have an anxiety disorder. Next, ADHD. So according to CDC again, 2017, some 9.4% of young people, 13 to 17, had ADHD, so close to 10% with problems concentrating, problems with hyperactivity, problems with impulsivity, or all three. So the most common type is the combined type, and we don't know how that, uh, uh, here we, you know, that's teen only. It, uh, the hyperactivity component does wear off as, um, as you get older, although the, the uh, impulsivity tends not to. Next, um, next depression in young people, 6 to 17. In 2011 to 12, 8.4% of teens were officially diagnosed with MDD, major depressive disorder. Of teens diagnosed with MDD, some 19% attempt suicide. So it's not a trivial matter. Almost a fifth um, attempt suicide once they have that diagnosis of MDD. Uh, and according to a uh, more recent survey about depressive symptoms, now this is not you know diagnosed MDD, but just depressive symptoms, almost one in three high school students, or 32 percent, reported feeling so sad or hopeless that they stopped doing their usual activities for two weeks in a row in the past year. And female high school students, 41%, were almost twice as likely as males to report depressive symptoms like that. So next, behavioral problems. Uh, CDC has 7.4% of young people uh, with behavioral problems, and I couldn't find a number specifically for teens. It's unclear whether teens would be higher than this or lower. Um, it, could, it could go either way based on what I've seen. Um, okay, next, autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, or another developmental disability. According to CDC's recent uh, Department of Health and Human Services data brief, number 291, and I, I cite this one specifically, and I even brought a copy of it because this is not the figure that's uh, widely quoted in the, this is not the figure that's widely quoted on the web. Um, but according to that, 6.9% um, of children diagnosed, okay, so the number of children 3 to 17, uh, 17 years old ever diagnosed with these uh, disorders were in 2016. So 6.9% of kids with any developmental disability. So 7% of kids with autism, intellectual disability, or some other developmental disability minus any overlaps among those three. So that's one in every 13.5 kids. Uh, so, uh, okay, basically, 4.5 kids got this other categoric category. Then 2.76 of kids were diagnosed with autism spectrum, 2.76%. So in 20, uh, this is in 2017 figures, 1 in 36, 2.76% of kids with autism. That actually is 1 in 36 kids. And um, I brought the data brief because I know that there will be some people among you who are saying, no, the number is still 1 in 59 or it's 1 in 80. But no, it's actually 
smaller than that. Then in New Jersey, it was 3%, 3 3.0%. Uh, and that's one in 34, though New Jersey's rates are slightly higher than the national rate for unknown reasons. So anyway, I brought these articles for anybody who's interested. Um, you know, I brought them. Uh, and then 1.14% of children were diagnosed with intellectual disability. That's pretty stable over time. So anyway, most of us in psychiatry don't see these individuals. They are diverted to enormous regional centers for neurologic disease. But in Dayton, Ohio, you know, where Kettering, our sister school is, and where I did part of my training, uh, there was no such regional trainer and tra training, uh, there was no regional center like that. And so, you know, a substantial chunk of my patients had autism. I would say it was between, you know, because I saw four patients every morning, it was at least one of them. Uh, it was at least one of them every single week. So one in four to one in three of my patients there had it. So next, uh, internet gaming disorder. According to DSM, among adolescents 15 to 19, about 8.4% of males and 4.5% of females. Overall, so about 6.5%. Although from what I see, I think that's a very conservative estimate. Um, next, trauma and PTSD. Studies show, you know, 15 to 43 percent of girls and 14 to 43 percent of guys go through at least one trauma. Of those teens who've had a trauma, 3 to 15 percent of females and 1 to 6 percent of males develop PTSD. So about 30 percent of our teens will have experienced some form of tra trauma, some life-threatening incident, uh, or witnessing some life-shortening, life-ending incident. Uh, have experienced that, and many of those will develop PTSD from it. So next, cannabis and alcohol use, I'm sorry. Teens report that they drank alcohol in the past month. Um, in eighth grade, about 8%, 10th grade, about 18.5%, 12th grade, 30%. So from 8% to nearly a third of high school seniors drinking alcohol. Uh, next, cannabis use. Teens reported that they used cannabis in the past month uh, about 6% in 10th grade, 18%, I'm sorry, 8th grade was 6%, 10th grade, 18%, 12th grade, 22.3%. So, you know, a fifth of our high school seniors using cannabis, um, and this overall is 7% 7 to, ne 7 to nearly a quarter of high school students on cannabis, now legal in some states. So, you know, I can talk to you about that one. Uh, next, nicotine use. In eighth grade, it's very low, 2.3%. Tenth grade, 3%. Twelfth grade, 5%. It's only 2 to 6%. But surprisingly, you know, nicotine is making a comeback. I, you know, biggest cause of morbidity, mortality in our country and ever known in history. Making a comeback among our youth, who knew? Uh, the vaping with different flavors. Um, that appeals to kids and may be part of the problem why it's why it's come back, why nicotine is back. So eating disorders, uh, according to NIH, among females 13 to 18, prevalence is only about 3.8%. Among males, it's 1.5%. So overall, eating disorders, about 2.5%. Next, gender dysphoric disorder. So according to DSM-5, I had to go there for these data, Gender incongruence, gender incongruence is vanishingly rare in the U.S. with prevalence of only 0.005% to 0.014%, and DSM was 2013. Um, however, according to more recent studies, um, this is self-report in Netherlands now, um, rates are closer to 1.1% of natal males and 0.8% of natal females. And in Belgium, they're roughly the same, 0.7% males, 0.6 natal females. More common in all countries, though, is gender ambivalence. So gender ambivalence or gender fluidity, you know, is rated in the Netherlands at 4.6% of males and 3.2% of females. Um, then in, that's Netherlands, Belgium, it's 2.2% of males, 1.9% of females. So from 1980 to 2015, there was a 20-fold rise in gender ambivalence. 
In the U.S., it's called you know gender fluidity. I see about 40 intensive outpatient patients every week, and of those, probably one quarter to a third at any time consider themselves gender fluid. I actually have to ask my young patients and not assume their gender. I have to say, do you consider yourself cisgender or transgender? I, I'm not kidding you. Um, Usually I have one or two at any given time who consider themselves transgendered and who are either on hormone therapy or actively requesting it. So it's a very important part of our uh, picture of our youth. So next, psychosis. So schizophrenia is thought to be pretty stable globally and at 1% or so. Um, however, a recent meta-analysis of some 19 studies uh, indicates that psychotic symptoms are not at all rare among adolescents. Median prevalence of psychotic symptoms was 17% among tweens 9 to 12 and 7% among teens 13 to 28 years old. And I have this uh, article here. Of special note, cannabis-induced psychotic disorder is increasingly common on our uh, inpatient unit at BMC here, at Loma Linda, some 20, uh, 20 teens are on the unit at any given time, and there are usually four or five who come in with psychosis. You ask them and the parents, wow, do you have a history of schizophrenia in your family? No, not that I, but what's happening? Well, they've been smoking wax pen. <laughs> they've been smoking THC or DAB which is a concentrate of cannabis. It's 10 times more potent, and it's exclusively THC, very psychoactive. And they've been using this for a few years. Um, so wax pen use, perhaps uh, on top of some genetic susceptibility or lack of ability to clear the THC from the body is probably the main reason for psychosis that we see among teens admitted uh, to the inpatient psychiatry unit here at Loma Linda. So to summarize um, the basic landscape, this doesn't include every disorder. We omit things like OCD that are uh, less common. Um, so lack of sleep, 75%. Stress, that's uh, really causing impairment, 60%. Chronic illness, 45%. Anxiety, 32%. Trauma, about 30% if you kind of add it all up. Alcohol use, 30%. Cannabis use, 22%. Those are, you know, in bold are the ones over 20%. So over one in five, they're bolded. And then kind of less common but still significant, ADHD at about 9%. Depression, 8%. Behavioral problems, 7%. Internet gaming disorder, 6.5%, although I would say that's conservative. Developmental disorders total, around 7%. Autism spectrum disorder, 2.76%. Nicotine, 2.6%. Eating disorders, 2.5%. Gender dysphoric disorder, um, the actual disorder, uh, 05 to 1.3%. And psychosis, 1% or more, given the substance-induced psychosis, which we're not counting here in this 1% figure. So in summary, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the landscape. Um, I've, you know, bolded the most common ones over 20%. Uh, the most serious ones, though, with the potential to end life, though, are actually the less common, fortunately. Uh, the less common ones, suicidal depression, psychosis, and anorexia, which actually has the highest mortality rate of any of the psychiatric disorders at around 20%. So with that diagnosis of anorexia, one in five actually dies of it. So anyway... Um, in light of these statistics, um, what do child and adolescent psychiatrists like me actually see that you, have, you who are not child psychiatrists don't see? Um, so, so basically, to get to our inpatient unit, you need to be suicidal, homicidal with a, uh, suicidal with a plan, homicidal with a plan, or psychotic. Um, so here are some very, very common scenarios that I see. I've listed the first, you know, top five or six scenarios that I see. So a very common presentation on the inpatient psychiatric unit is 16-year-old girl, 16, got deeply involved with a boy, had sex with a boy. Then the boy texted nude pictures of the girl all over the school, causing the girl to try to commit suicide. 
by taking all the pills she could find. Mom finds her, calls the ambulance. After medical hospitalization, eventual clearance, she's transferred to us. And I can't tell you how common this is, either the suicide attempt or a quasi one with you know five pills or this is probably the most common presentation. Girl has sex, is dumped, is humiliated, and wants to die. That's, that's, that's my number one. So here's another common scenario all the time we see this. Inpatient case number two, 15-year-old um, boy, parents discipline the boy by taking his cell phone away. You know, he's done some egregious thing. Parents take his cell phone away. Boy has an addiction to video games and or pornography. He either freaks out and self-injures, banging his head or fists against the wall, slashing his wrists very deeply, or he attacks parents physically or verbally, scaring them into calling 911. This is really common. You can see whole YouTube videos online going 15 minutes. Boy freaks out after cell phone taken away. I mean, you see these boys banging their bed, bang banging their head, and it goes on and on for like 15 minutes. There's several of those on YouTube if you're interested. So another not uncommon patient present, presentation is this. 17-year-old boy has been smoking wax pen since he was 10. Now he's disorganized, psychotic, he's unable to think clearly. He takes off his clothes, he wanders aimlessly, mumbling, responding to internal stimuli, these voices that command him to hurt himself or others. He's eventually picked up by police who drop him directly at the BMC. They bypassing the ER, thank you, <laughs> dropping them directly at the BMC. Um, then the next level of care is um, down from inpatient. We often step kids down to the partial hospitalization program and from there to the inpatient, the um, intensive uh, outpatient programs. And these are paid for by Medicare, Medicaid. So it's all part of one kind of continuous swoop that goes for a good three months, we have these kids covered. You know, a week on inpatient, two weeks on the partial hospitalization program, which is basically nine to three, then they sleep at home. Then going from there, another eight to 10 weeks on the intensive outpatient where I mainly work. That's another eight to 10. So all in all, you've got 12 months covered. And then they can follow up with us, you know, who know them well. Upstairs in the outpatient clinic, they can be seen by residents or fellows. You know, if it's a complex and interesting case, we'll give it to the fellows. Um, but anyway, they have a lot of follow-up with us. It's a very comprehensive program. So anyway, here's a common uh, partial hospitalization case. So 13-year-old um, girl, she's been assaulted or trafficked when much younger. So she's 13 now. She was basically raped or assaulted when she was younger. Now she realizes what that was, what had happened to her, and that it was a crime, and that it's humiliating and shameful and criminal. So now she begins cutting, then tries to kill herself by ingesting pills or drinking bleach, very common. She's already been to the BMC, now she's stepping down to PHPIOP to kind of figure it, this out and process Another case, 14-year-old um, female to male transgendered person who prefers to be addressed by a preferred new masculine name, something like Blake or Jack or Zach, and by the pronoun they. Having difficulties with parents, as parents say the patient's still a girl, feminine as a child. Parents refuse to call the teen by the self-chosen new name and continue with Lily or Marissa or Alyssa also having difficulties with established friends, they now reject the patient's new gender identity. Patient now feels isolated, rejected at home and school, begins cutting or some other quasi-suicidal activity. So now moving to outpatient clinics. In the outpatient clinics, those who come straight there, um, it's usually something, you know, routine. Uh, stress with poor academic performance, that's probably the biggest one. Anxiety with panic attacks, depression with uh, intermittent suicidal thoughts without any plan, nothing really specific, substance use or ADHD. So, you know, those are very common, probably our bread and butter of the um, outpatient clinics. Um, estimated 80% of outpatient visits used to be ADHD. Now I would add in there a few other developmental things. but. Okay, so here are some outpatient clinic cases. Um, and this, these were actually not from here. These were from Dayton, Ohio. 
Uh, again, there was no regional center there, and one of the hospitals, Dayton Children's, was the diagnostic center, so we saw all of those patients. Uh, so anyway, I saw autistic teen males uh, all the time. Uh, autism, four times more common in males, roughly, than female, three and a half to four more common in males than females. So here's one case. 16-year-old, adolescent male, so out of control, rushing into traffic, grabbing and breaking things, that dad had to supervise him and wrestle with him physically 24-7. I mean, literally, this dad just spent his time harnessing this immensely strong <laughs> adolescent boy. And the boy had just two words. Those two words were ATT phone book. So when he would get excited to see me or whatever, he would say, ATT phone book, ATT phone book. You know, that was, that was his presentation. Another, as a 17-year-old male, he was out of control mainly at school because he was attracted to a peer female. He would charge at her and headbutt her while exhibiting physical signs of arousal. So the boy had about 10 words according to his mom. The ones I heard were the girl's name and the word anxious, which he would pronounce like that, anxious. You know, this poor boy. So anyway, I see these scenarios very commonly, and so the need of our adolescents is really just help with these problems. Um, so before looking at the solutions, um, let's take a look at, you know, just a glance at the systems most strongly impacting the kids. That would be the family, the schools, that's where they spend most of their day. And then a new category, electronic media, because while they're in either of those two settings, they're interacting usually with the electronic media. So families today, very diverse, increasingly common problems, economic hardship, about half, parents not having enough time to spend with their kids, uh, and substance use on the part of the parents. <laughs> so as we saw at the beginning of this talk, about half of adolescents live in low-income or poverty settings. Rare are households in which one parent's able to not work, stay home with the kids, cook proper meals, help with homework, driving the kids to their activities, chaperoning them with their friends or at the mall, encouraging them to do their chores, taking them to religious services. I mean, how rare is that? We haven't seen that for quite a few decades, the parent who's available for all of that, which is actually necessary to raise a healthy kid. Parents are working or they're tired after working also uh, totally understandable. Also, unfortunately, substance use on the part of parents with the neglect of the kids is also extremely common. Child protective services also often has to be called. Kids have to be removed to live with relatives, to join foster care systems, or to live in county subsidized group homes. There was one hospital in Dayton that I worked at several years ago, the inner city one in Dayton. It was a whole generation of parents wiped out to drug use. And who came in with the kids who had ADHD? It was the grandparents. It was grandma, it was grandpa. They were very caring, but they were not the actual parents anymore because that generation was wiped out. Dayton is, you know, an exception. It's an extreme. That's the epicenter of the opioid crisis that's taken so many of, you know, parent age people. So anyway, there's another problem too here. You know, this has gone on for quite a few decades now. Oftentimes parents themselves were not raised in that, you know, loving manner we think about as being the way you raise a kid. Often even the grandparents were not raised with much love. So after two or three generations of people who've not been raised with much love, there isn't much cohesion in that family. And I've come to know some extremely troubled families. For example, I've met multiple families in which the kids did not speak the same language as the mother. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, I would have thought that not possible to occur, but I've seen it now multiple times. Schools today, also very diverse, uh, ranging from continuation schools to college prep schools, very poor public high schools to private high schools that resemble exclusive private colleges. Common problems, though, everywhere are bullying, dating violence, including sexual assault, academic stress, and poor academic performance. Electronic media, this category includes the music, the TV, social media, the video games our youth are listening to, watching, interacting with in some way. Common problems, violence, uh, 
pornography and spreading pessimism, negativism, the sort of dark culture where they're interested in Satan and darkness and all of that. Uh, yet these media are very addictive for many. So anyway, uh, lest we despair, um, let's look at some solutions to these problems the youth are facing. So electronic media. Uh, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, this is the body that child psychiatrists kind of follow their regulations, called ACAP, recommends limiting total screen time to not more than two hours a day. Um, less is more, definitely. For families who can adhere to this, the rewards can be huge in terms of family cohesion, academic performance, performance in extracurriculars, and the like. So ACAP also recommends that parents monitor the kinds of images kids are exposed to, eliminating the violence, the drug exposures, bullying, and so on. Filters have been developed to do this, just, just this kind of thing. Or you can encourage your patients to turn it off entirely. It's probably not realistic, but except for homework. Uh, and then what would your kids do instead? Well, depends on the family, but you know, walk the dog, do yard work, other chores, cook, read, talk to family members, you know, hang out, breathe the air. Um, schools, uh, new federal laws have come into existence in recent decades uh, that allow kids to have um, 504 plans and individualized education plans. So these allow kids to have extra help in the classroom, time and a half on homework and tests, sometimes to have different uh, curriculum entirely. Uh, then there are other options. There's home hospital, where the parents can stay home with a kid. A tutor actually comes to the house. There's homeschooling, and sometimes combinations of homeschool and at school. For example, some kids do most of their work at home, but then they go to school one day for a few hours to submit the work and talk about it. Other kids take two classes a day at school, the rest at home. Others take one or two days per week at school and then have a long, long weekend. Still others complete high school in community colleges, you know, getting both their high school and AA degrees at the same time while avoiding a lot of the drama with their friends in uh, high school. Sometimes that helps. Uh, suffice it to say that schools today allow a great many options other than that, you know, eight to three, five day per week mainstream program. Uh, education is very fast becoming personalized. And at least half of the kids in PHP IOP are taking advantage of one or more of these non-traditional programs. So the family. A number of excellent family-based programs exist now for helping adolescents and their families. Uh, you know, helping the kids to uh, overcome trauma and often helping families overcome multi-generational family trauma. You know, where teens are having problems, um, often helping the entire family unit helps the most. And when you look at the whole family, actually the teen is often the one with the fewest problems. Uh, the least pathology in comparison with uh, parents, grandparents. Uh, in those cases, working to restore the mental health of the whole family is what helps the teens get the love and help they need. So do use family therapists whenever possible. Use family-based, whole family-based programs. Also, do refer couples that appear to be in trouble to marriage and family therapists as well, and do refer parents to individual therapists if that appears to be needed. So anyway, I'll describe two family-based programs briefly, then focus on our own programs here at LLU. Um, to name some of these briefly, they're uh, very successful. James Hudsiak's Vermont family-based approach, also very successful. James Gordon's work with adolescents through his Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Then I'll discuss in detail you know, our programs here. So what is the Vermont uh, family-based approach? That's a family program in which family wellness coaches um, implement a comprehensive program of wellness. It's evidence-based emotional and behavioral health and wellness. Um, you know, where indicated families are also partnered with focused family coaches working on some specific issue and a family-based psychiatrist where medications are indicated. And this is regarded as basically the premier program of its kind in the US. Very good data associated, associated with that I don't have time to go into right now. Now, James Gordon's program also, very comprehensive family-based program, step-by-step -step method 
for reversing the biological and psychological damage trauma can cause. It's been implemented not just here in the U.S., but in several locations throughout the world, in the Balkans, in the Middle East, in Africa, among Native Americans, and also um, in the U.S. where school shootings have occurred. So you can look into this one as well. James Gordon has a book, The Transformation, Discovering Wholeness and Healing After Trauma, and it's Harper and Collins. But anyway, what Loma Linda does, uh, Loma Linda's programs, I referred to them earlier, PHP IOP, partial hospital and intensive outpatient, much shorter to say PHP IOP. These are comprehensive family-based manualized programs rooted in state-of-the-art theories and evidence. These run from 3.30 to 6.30, three days a week, eight to 10 weeks, as I mentioned. And some kids repeat the whole cycle over again if they have to. This is longitudinal treatment. We have several of these programs. SHIELD for chronically suicidal, self-injuring youth. MEND for youth with depression and a mental illness. Freedom for teens and adults with eating disorders. FLEX for kids with, uh, and teens with ADHD. Dual diagnosis for teens with substance use and depression, and then mental health one and two uh, for teens with trauma. Now, I just want to say a word about mental health one and two. Those are not easy tracks. They're for processing trauma. Again, in, all of these are in small groups of eight kids each. It's hard work. It's, you know, what it is is talking to the chair as if it were that person who traumatized you in some way, writing a letter to that person but not sending it, uh, making your own trauma timeline and seeing how that has contributed to your feelings now, looking, believe it or not, at your parents' trauma timeline and how that impacted your parents so you have a better understanding of your parent. Having a mock funeral, literally writing your own obituary and hearing the eulogies about yourself, finding out what your parents and peers, peers will miss about you, understanding just how special you've always been to people or they wouldn't be there with their kid. It's a huge time investment. Okay, so then I'll zoom in on SHIELD though uh, and show some of the data for SHIELD. Okay, so SHIELD, this is the one for chronically suicidal self-injuring adolescents, both females and males. So the teens meet together with the different, with, you know, they meet together with a therapist three times a week. It's about three hours a day. First half, they're with their peers, group of eight kids. They go through different exercises in the SHIELD manual for that first hour and a half. Then the other half, parents come in with the teens, work right alongside them, learning the same skills the teens learn so they can reinforce those at home. So the manual consists of dialectical behavioral therapy. This is a common mode of therapy now, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. This That's for adults, but uh, the developer of that DBT therapy, Dr. Marsha Linehan, actually came here to Loma Linda back in 2009 to work with us to develop this and adapt this for our teens. So um, her, in her program, or our combined program, these have been adapted and you know, skills are taught, skills for emotional regulation, interpersonal skills, problem solving skills, lifestyle skills, and so forth. Um, for example, one skill taught is called the please skill, where, you know, please is the mnemonic. It consists of the basic elements of lifestyle medicine, also very much promoted here at Loma Linda, as you all know. So the P in please, this is physical or psychiatric illness treatment. So go to your therapy and take your medications, if any. L, love yourself and others. This means nurture yourself, care for yourself, as if you were someone else you loved. Eat, uh, the E is eat, eat well. This is critical for physical and emotional health, to eat well. A, avoid mood-altering substances in particular. S, sleep enough. E, exercise every day, an hour if you can, if you're a kid. So the domains of lifestyle psychiatry are diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, emotional connectedness, and the avoidance of toxic substances. So with this skill, which is from DBT, the kids and parents essentially learn the basics of lifestyle medicine and how to incorporate these into their daily lives in order to prevent, treat, and reverse psychiatric problems. 
So what are the outcomes of the SHIELD IOP program? For that time period, 2009 to 2013, graduates did better than non-graduates in all areas assessed. Uh, you know, we do entry and exit uh, data. Interpersonal skills, intrapersonal distress, social problems, behavioral functionality, and critical life skills. Moreover, even adolescents who attended briefly but didn't graduate had improved outcomes compared with baseline in all areas assessed, and these were all the same domains. So among graduates, post-treatment scores often showed complete remission of symptoms in the domains of overall distress, frustration with the parent-teen relationship, behavioral problems, and self-harm or cutting. So adolescents have healed, whole families have healed. Many kids do better with just one trip through a given IOP program, and again, we encourage kids not to give up, to come back again and again if necessary. And we let them know that we will never give up on them, never ever. We will assist the teens and their families to deprogram out whatever pathology is there, to reprogram in good habits conducive to mental wellness among teens, their siblings, their parents. So here's how you can refer adolescent patients to LOU's inpatient unit. Basically, inpatient is at BMC, which is 1710 Barton Road. The best way is to go through the emergency department. The unit gets overloaded if you go directly there, and it's not set up for that. So please do refer them to the emergency department first. Then PHP and IOP, they're at the BHI. This is the Behavioral Health Institute at 1686 Barton Road. This is just two buildings over from the BMC. And tell patients to go there to the first floor reception area to ask, schedule for an intake appointment. The intake appointment's about an hour and a half. You have to go there and inter be interviewed by the intake nurse. Um, so here's the number. Uh, they take all insurance, including IEHP, which is uh, Medicaid. They don't take one private insurance provider. I can say what that is if anybody's interested later on. So for outpatient clinics, um, outpatient clinics, that's the second floor reception area of BHI. So you can just go there, or here's that number for that one as well. And they take almost all insurance as well. And you know, you can check at the front desk, is the insurance taken? So in summary, many of our youth today not well. Of course, some are well, truly. Uh, and that's terrific. And we congratulate those families that, despite modern life, have managed to stay intact and high functioning. However, about half of our 42 million youth today are unwell, physically, mentally, or both. They have chronic diseases like asthma. They have chronic psychiatric disorders like anxiety, depression, substance use. Some 21 million of our youth have those. The institutions that serve our youth, modern families, schools, electronic media, though now troubled in some ways, are beginning to change to adapt to a new normal, almost, of teens with mental illness. But the good news is that positive changes have already started emerging in all of these systems and programs. And teens with every kind of mental Ill illness are getting more of the kind of help that they need with programs such as those at LLU. And it's my work and I think the work of all of us here at Loma Linda University collectively to ensure that the funding and the momentum are there you know, for these programs to keep going and that we never ever give up on our youth. Uh, that we meet and keep meeting this, their psychiatric needs. Um, so, you know, our mission here at Loma Linda to make man whole, a corollary of that, um, you know, to make our youth whole, you know, to the extent we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Green. We have some time for some questions, and uh, this year we're going to try to use our, our, uh, Special microphone here. Which, uh, while we're getting that ready, here, I'll go ahead and give you that. We have a question right up here. Hi, Dr. Green, thank you for that presentation. Uh, well, why has there been an increase in autism and has this been due to an increase in awareness and resources, which has then led to an increase in diagnosis? Or has the true incidence and prevalence truly have, has, has gone up? Have we figured out the answer to that question? 
Yeah, no, we really haven't. Uh, there have been some studies suggesting that at least one third of it is increased diagnosis. You know, increased. You know, we're you know increasingly aware these kids are getting the help they need. They're getting diagnosed. So at least a third of the growth is accounted for by that alone. Then there's the fact that um, with DSM-5 that came out in 2013, they broadened what counts as autism. You know, it used to be that there were different categories for uh, all these divisions were, you know, they broadened that spectrum out to include a lot of other things. So that could be part of it as well. And some say, you know, part of it could be something else that we don't know about. So then, the, so two thirds is not due to an increase in diagnosis. Yeah, it could be. That's what people are saying. And so even, uh, you know, uh, you know, many publications will put epidemic in quotes. You know, because when you look at the graph, it looks like this. I kid you not. Incidents, you know, one in ten thousand. You know, back in 1980. Now it's literally one in 36. Uh, it looks like an epidemic. That follows the, you know, genetic uh, things can't account for that curve. And yet, you know, uh, we are, you know, more aware of it. We're diagnosing it more. And they broaden that diagnosis out on the spectrum. So, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated. It's hard to parse out. I don't know if anybody can. But I don't know. Um, okay. If it is an environmental trigger, which usually accounts for epidemic uh, uh, epidemics it's usually an environmental insult we don't know what that is so you know that's the problem we don't have any smoking gun we can point to or we actually can say you know a third is this a third is this and that other third is you know we don't know what that is many people speculate there was a lot of controversy around vaccines it turned out that they were not mm -hmm. responsible for that increase so that was carefully studied I'm going to see if I can sneak in one, one more here. Have you discovered a connection between lifestyle medicine and mental health, and specifically what connections ha have you explored? Oh, you know, for child psychiatry, lifestyle medicine has always been there. That's always been, you know, if you even look up, you know, in, on ACAP, you know, uh, self-evaluate for your, you know, intake at ADHD or your follow-up for ADHD. You know, you're supposed to be checking off these boxes of, you know, are they sleeping enough? Are they exercising? Are they having good diet? You know, lifestyle stuff. For those of you who don't know lifestyle medicine, the six domains, um, diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, you know, emotional wellness, and avoidance of toxins. Those are the six domains. Those domains have always been there in child psychiatry. So I can't say we're really doing anything differently except that there's more data. We're running on much more data now than we had before. For example, we now know how much sleep it takes. We now know where the sweet point is for exercise. Biggest bang for the buck for kids is one hour a day, five days a week. Half of it's moderate, half of it's vigorous. So we know things like that. Um, we know the dangers of cannabis. There are whole systematic reviews of how cannabis increases anxiety. Cannabis does contribute to psychosis. You know, there are whole meta-analyses, many, many studies. So we know what kids should be uh, avoiding now. Before we could kind of say, you know, don't smoke uh, or drink. Now we can add cannabis and a few other things to that list. We have another question over in the bleachers to the right. I was recently asked by a very intelligent nurse to excuse her children from getting vaccines because of her concern about autism. Have any other physicians here been asked that question to release uh, their the children? You know, I personally have not gotten that question. Uh, I'm in psychiatry, we don't give vaccines, but I, I don't know, are there pediatricians here who can answer that question? Are you a pediatrician? Can you answer that question? Do they? Daily, he said daily, you know. Uh, daily, people are asked, and they're concerned about the the substances in the vaccine. Is that correct? Concerns about aluminum, mercury, retroviruses. You know. Another question here. So seventy per, five percent. I I flew out from Maine yesterday. And Tuesday, we had an election, a referendum, that 75% of the population voted 
to uphold a state law that made medical exemptions the only exemptions. Previously, it was philosophical and religious that were very easily to obtain. So there are going to be a lot more of those questions coming to us. You know, California did the same thing, and we'll, we'll have to see how that works out. Another question yeah. here. Yeah, thank you. Your array of uh, treatment options for the various uh, diagnostic groups there's really, really impressive, and, and I really appreciate that availability, and I refer to it often, actually. Um, and, uh, and I also really appreciate your point about how to best refer, um, because many of my parents will say, I, I, I went to inquire about this or that program for my child, and I, I don't know if this is something that you would address, and I'm not wanting to put you on the spot, but the most common response I get from my parents is they couldn't give me an appointment um, or they said it would be weeks. And I'm wondering if, if that's a realistic um, sort of barrier to getting the kids into the program or are they accessing the program in the best way? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know about autism, but psychiatric illness among the youth is an epidemic when you consider it all told. Uh, and there are 7,000 of us child psychiatrists in this country. We probably need about 40,000. I'm, I'm not kidding. Um, you know, to get a job in child psychiatry, just kind of put your finger up. You know, <laughs> you'll be, you'll be, uh, some headhunter will find you. Um, there is tremendous need. We did recently have to shut down our intakes for the resident-run clinic just because they were, we were so flooded uh, with uh, need. Um, so anyway, we do the best we can. We do struggle. There are wait lists for the IOP programs. Um, and we do give preference for the inpatient kids. So really, to guarantee admission to the PHP IOP tracks, you almost have to be at that level of severity to, uh, you know, to go to the inpatient unit that's suicidal, homicidal, psychotic, to get fed into that track. Otherwise, there is a two or three uh, week waiting list usually. We only so have I'm time. sorry about that. We do the best we can. There aren't enough of us. We only have time for two more questions. One down to the right. Um, Will, uh, from the point of view of uh, IOP, okay. Will the workflow lend itself to televideo visits, at least in the return environment? Oh, in, I, in IOP, uh, televisual, no, I don't think so, okay. no. IOP, PHP, I don't think so. The biggest point of those is that connection with another human being, and often it's, you know, to get over <laughs> a video game addiction and an extreme isolation so the whole point is you really, you know, to bond with peers. That group of eight, oh, it's so effective. You, you f suddenly realize, I'm not the only one who has, you know, been traumatized, you know, been raped. Uh, I'm not the only one who is failing all of my classes because I'm so depressed. I'm not the only one. And you get feedback, you get empathy from peers instead of bullying which is what you get at school, bullying, ridicule, humiliation. You get actual empathy, and that is so powerful. And also, just to be there, you need a guardian willing to come with you. That bond, I've never seen it not get stronger. So automatically there, you're going to have more, more help at home. So I wouldn't think a telepsych setting. For outpatient, though, yes. I think that a telepsych is the way to go for outpatient. Um, I've worked in those clinics. They can be very effective. But even with telepsych, usually what will happen is, you know, you meet with a family first in person, and thereafter you can do those telepsych visits. No problem. Then they know who you are. They get the feel of who you are. You're not just a television uh, character and vice versa. You, you really, you know, it's, it's hard to hide things when you see them all live, you know, in front of you, that family and how they're interacting. On television, I'm not sure that if that were the only interface that I'd really comprehend that. This is a sympathetic question, though it'll come across as a critique, because I understand your problem. But I'm an emergency physician, so the comment of take them to the ED first 
Oh, of whoops. course. Is, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> is, 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 I understand the situation, Mtala, critical, you know, is it a medical condition, psychiatric? I understand, excuse, believe me. But in Arizona, evidently, they've changed some of the laws where law enforcement and EMS can now present itself to a psych hospital acutely and then if they're and then the and then the triage and the initial evaluation for mental health behavioral health mental uh, medical acute medical condition be done and then the patient can then be taken to an emergency department if there's an acute medical condition but i guess arizona's tweaking their laws to encourage ems and law enforcement who even though they don't have clinical training ex expertise have experience and ems can make a pretty good guess in law enforcement too about whether the patient needs to go to a er to get down from their speed and coke, coked out, or whether there's a behavioral, behavioral issue, family issue that needs to go, uh, let's say. So the question is, do you ever anticipate uh, 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 mental health, uh, uh, behavioral health hospitals ever having a acute triage room where the patients will not sit in ERs for two or three days because? Ah, no worries. You know, <laughs> that already happens. Uh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> But yeah, police drop the kids off there all the time. Police do it, parents do it. Yeah, people who have been there once before, they drop their kid off, they know they can do that, they know Imtala applies. They know we have to take that kid. Um, and so as a result of that, my very first time I visited Loma Linda, I walked through the inpatient corridor. You know, there's an inpatient for adolescents, there's inpatient for kids. There were literally four mattresses on the floor in the hallway <laughs> of the adolescent unit. Um, and like, you know, uh, that, that happens because of legal necessity. It's not the best for the kids. You know, they're traumatized or they've been, you know, assaulted and then they have to sleep in the hallway, you know, with people walking past and feeling vulnerable and dressed in like a flimsy green gown. I mean, uh, it's not the best. I mean, we have to do it legally, but we want to discourage uh, people from coming directly there for admission just because that's the care you end up receiving, and it's unfortunate, but that's what has to be done. So, better our hallway than an ER hallway. Yeah, I guess so, you know, I mean, we'll I guess so, there's a balance We'll continue there. this debate. Anyway, thank you all. <laughs> I just wanna say one thing, you know, the wide variety of programs in our partial inpatient, uh, intensive outpatient, that has nothing to do with me, that was set up by Dr. William Murdoch, who's been here 12 years, who's done a fantastic job with those programs. Um, so I have, we, you know, we all have our chairman to thank for that one. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Green.